Welcome to Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today is on lectures 5 and 6 in seminar 2. In this video, I'll address the following questions. 1. How is the death drive evident in Freud's early essay, The Project for a Scientific Psychology? 2. What does it mean to say the subject is no one? And 3. How does reflexivity produce the unconscious and its insistence? If you learned something from this video and wish to support this work, please consider liking it, sharing it, and subscribing to my channel. In these two lectures, we are introduced to the dynamics of psychic reality, how compromises are sought between the pleasure principle and reality principle, as well as how, no matter the compromise struck between these two principles, there remains something that upsets the balance, giving rise to a beyond of the pleasure principle. So let us begin with question one. How is the death drive evident in Freud's early essay, The Project for a Scientific Psychology? This essay by Freud, written in 1895, though unpublished in Freud's lifetime, provides a glimpse into Freud's early thought and how its ideas find their way back into his later writings, especially in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. The essay develops an economic model of the nervous system aimed at providing a physiological basis for psychopathology. Freud proposes a principle of inertia, or homeostasis, which is the mind's default mode whereby it seeks to restore itself to a lower state of tension. The pleasure principle, symbolized by psi, addresses tensions arising endogenously from one's internal environment, symbolized by q eta. The reality principle, which is symbolized by phi, addresses tensions arising exogenously from one's outside environment, symbolized by Q, or external quantity. Psychic reality emerges from the intersection of these two principles. Though both principles aim at decreasing tension, they go about it in different ways. The reality principle does not try to completely rid the psychic system of tension, since it needs some to mobilize the will to act and to deal with the demands of the external world, what Freud calls the exigencies of life. When it wishes to reduce tension, it can do so by withdrawing or fleeing from its source. But such a strategy is not available to the pleasure principle, which addresses tensions arising endogenously, such as the bodily demands for hunger and sex. Like the reality principle, the preferred path of discharge would be what Freud calls a flight from the stimulus. However, withdrawing from the body is not an option as it is to withdraw from the external environment. Instead, endogenous tension is reduced by taking specific actions in the external world. Here we can appreciate what might be the beginning connection between repetition and the death drive. If the death drive is a tendency to reduce tension, to the point of seeking the cessation of life, and external action is the primary means of reducing such tension, then the compulsion to repeat is an expression of this attempt at a radical reduction of tension, to return to our original inert state of inorganic material. We may wonder how the death drive and the pleasure principle are distinct since they seem to both aim at reducing tension. For Lacan, the life drive, which expresses the pleasure principle, and the death drive are not the opposing forces that they're often understood to be with Freud. The life drive is in the service of the death drive. However, it diverts it in such a way as to sustain life rather than to end it. Question two. What does it mean to say the subject is no one? The subject is no one, according to Lacan. It's not an individual, and especially not a personality. In the French, Lacan states, le sujet est personne. There's a peculiarity in the French language in which the word personne can mean either no one or a person. What's not certain is whether Lacan is engaging in some wordplay here. There are several reasons why I suspect he is. First, Lacan tends to play with the sounds and double meaning of words, as is evident in his concept of le nom du père. This translates to the name of the father, but since the M is silent, it also sounds like the no of the father. And in fact, both interpretations are correct in the sense that 
the name of the father has a prohibitive function. Second, I suspect a play on words because at other places in his seminars, Lacan identifies the subject and its history as a singularity, which is also the locus of truth. To say the subject is no one would ordinarily suggest that the subject is some formless, unindividuated principle. Yet this no one, this person, is more likely a rejection of the kind of individuality that's being promoted by the ego, rather than the uniqueness of the subject, who is distinguished not by a set of personality traits, but by the way the other lives through it. Here, we seem to find a notion of the subject that's somewhat reminiscent of a particular theological understanding of persons found in the writings of the early church fathers, expressed by the concept of hypostasis. This Greek word came to be translated in Latin as persona. So what is a hypostasis and how is it in any way like Lacan's notion of the subject? Just as the subject is distinguished from the ego, so too the hypostasis is distinguished from the prosopon or the mask one wears, what we might call one's personality. A hypostasis is the individual's being, but it's different from the impersonal being of the ancient Greeks. It's a highly particular being, a singularity, if you will. Again, we're reminded of Lacan's identifying of the symbolic with being, a being that is also singular. Finally, the hypostasis is itself sustained only through the other, which of course in a religious context is principally understood to be the divine other. The point here is not whether the subject and the hypostasis converge entirely. In fact, Metropolitan John Zizoulas in his work Communion and Otherness suggests that they do not as Lacan holds an entirely distinct understanding of otherness in his view. Nonetheless, this analysis does suggest that perhaps behind Lacan's statement that le sujet est personne is the appropriation of a concept originating from theology, a move he makes from time to time in these seminars. Question three, how does reflexivity produce the unconscious and its insistence? In addition to saying the subject is no one, in these lectures, Lacan also claims that the unconscious subject occurs when the subject takes itself into account. To understand how this might be possible, let's turn to set theory and Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which, as has been argued, have had some influence on Lacan. Set theory is a kind of mathematical logic that considers sets or collections of things or objects or numbers. Gödel's incompleteness theorems demonstrate the impossibility of complete certainty and consistency concerning mathematical truths within a number set. I strongly recommend a recent video uploaded by Veritasium entitled This is Math's Fatal Flaw, which goes into depth about set theory and Gödel's theorem. You should probably watch it keeping in mind Lacan's understanding of the unconscious. I think you'll find some notable implications. I provided a link to it in the description. What's interesting for us here is that mathematical sets seem to get along just fine. That is, they remain provable and consistent up until they take themselves into account. To illustrate this, I'll look at a logical paradox rather than a mathematical one. I understand that they're not the same thing, which is an error sometimes attributed to Wittgenstein in his own analysis of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Nonetheless, it's hopefully illustrative for our purposes here. So let's take the set of all truth statements. A truth statement, when properly worded, should be either true or false. A dog barks is true. A cat lays eggs is false. But then if you run across a sentence like this, this sentence is false. Like Lacan's depiction of the unconscious, it's a statement that takes itself into account. But in doing so, it produces a paradox. If the sentence is true, then the sentence is false. If this sentence is false, then it's true. It's a claim that is intrinsically undecidable. Such paradoxes can be found in certain mathematical statements as well, which render impossible the establishment of certainty and consistency 
of a number set since a numerical set for it to be complete must account for itself as well. Consequently, such statements must be excluded from the set. And yet doing so results in that number set being incomplete. We can now see the relevance of Lacan's claim that the unconscious originates from the subject taking itself into account. Just as the reflexive statement creates an endlessly repeating loop without resolution, the reflexive turn of the subject produces an insistence or compulsion to repeat that prevents satisfaction. Now how or where is this insistence created? Lacan suggests that there are different registers that can be used. In seminar three, he'll indicate that it's the insistence of speech whereby a specific signifier seeks a return to the life of the subject, despite the resistances of the ego to block it. When we're talking about a reflexive turn of the subject, we are speaking of signifiers addressing themselves in a sort of fixed pattern. However, the entire symbolic does not operate like this. Ordinarily, each signifier connects to other signifiers in a signifying chain, but the signifier that refers to itself is disconnected from the rest of the chain and operates independently. And though I'm going a bit far afield from what's stated in lectures five and six, it would seem that trauma is the origin of this reflexivity. Trauma is assigned a signifier, which is what makes the trauma traumatic retroactively. But that signifier is repressed, and instead of associating with other signifiers, it associates only with itself in such a manner that might be what produces the unconscious itself. This insistence of the signifier manifests itself in the compulsion to repeat, which is expressed through external actions, and especially transference. In Freud's essay discussed earlier in this video, he noted that such actions represent an attempt to reduce tension, though in a way that is ultimately destructive toward oneself and others. And so we're offered some insight into the relationship between repetition and the death drive. We'll continue to unfold and clarify these ideas as we progress. And with that, we'll end today's video. In the next video, we'll examine lecture seven, where we consider Lacan's assessment of Maurice Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology as it's applied to psychoanalysis. Thanks for watching. Until next time, be well. Mm -hmm.